welcome everyone to uh, the uh, Assyrian history class. And today is going to be a discussion on challenges to Assyrian power during what we call the Middle Assyrian period. And uh, the Middle Assyrian period is approximately from, say, 1600 to about 1000 BC. So it's a period of 600 years. And let me just say um, why it's kind of important to know the Middle Assyrian period, because we often do not associate the Assyrian art that we know, which is largely the what's known as the Neo-Assyrian art, with this period, because that came later. But the Middle Assyrian period is really the basis upon which the Assyrian Empire, which became a world empire, is really set. So. And, and of course, the Middle Assyrian period and the Middle Assyrian conquest and state building are based on the old Assyrian period. So there's a continuous history. Scholars, of course, as we said before, break this into three periods, <clears throat> excuse me, the old Assyrian period, the Middle Assyrian period, and the Neo, new Assyrian period. Why we call the new Assyrian period, the Neo Assyrian period, is um, as good of a uh, guess as, as uh, you, can, uh, you can figure. So, so let me talk about challenges to Assyrian power largely during this middle Assyrian period. We discussed last time Assyrians uh, waging war and being in conflict with the largely the Hittites and the Mitanni. And uh, a lot of these encounters were um, both with combination. They weren't strictly, um, uh, not strictly, of course, uh, violent. They were also diplomatic on the one hand, at times uh, more violent, but they were not simply uh, the case of, of Assyrians waging war against people. Well, today we're going to focus on how the Assyrians met their challenges with regard to uh, the Babylonians or Chaldeans and Aramaeans, uh, people to the south of Mesopotamia. And I want to say a couple of things uh, before, because really this period of time and these terms, this terminology that we're using becomes very important even for modern times. You're going to hear certain terms that are used today very loosely, not very carefully, among Assyrians themselves, leading to a lot of uh, division in uh, terms of de defining one's ethnicity and identity and so on. So this has repercussions for modern times. So it's important to understand the history behind this. So in addition to discussing how Assyrians met their challenges, I'm going to talk about some of this terminology. What does it mean to be a Chaldean in the ancient past? What does it mean to be an Assyrian? And before I get into that, I want to tell you a little story that I've, I've told before. When I was um, at the University of Chicago's Oriental Institute, I happened to follow a tour guide, um, a lady uh, who was very excited about giving a lecture about the ancient Egyptians, she went for about half an hour in the Egyptian section or something like that. And then the museum, of course, wasn't what it is today, which is when you first enter, you'll see the Assyrian wing bull and you'll see the Mesopotamian section, largely the Assyrian section, and then you will see the Egyptian and uh, Anatolian sections and later in the Persian section. At that time, the museum was set up so that you would enter and you would see a largely Egyptian display. So this lady, who was a tour guide, went on about Egyptian culture and talked about King Tut and all the things people are excited to know about Egypt. When she passed the Assyrian section, she simply said a few things. She said, these people were barbaric and ruthless, and you can see it in their art, and, uh, and uh, they disappeared or something like that. So, of course, I had to uh, stop her and find out why she did that. So I, 
I engaged her afterwards and I said, why would you say something like that? And then finally being frustrated, she said, why do you care? And I said, well, I'm an Assyrian. And she said, oh, <laughs> she laughed. She said, you can't be an Assyrian. You're one of those Middle Eastern Christians. And so we talked for a long time. So she was under the impression that we are Aramaic speaking Christians and not Assyrians. So today's lecture is going to be in part addressing both the misunderstanding that people have about Assyrian history during this time in particular when the Assyrian Empire and state are growing and developing and uh, whether the Assyrians survive and what does it mean to be Aramaic speaking. So I hope you stay with me on this as we journey into Assyrian history during the Middle Assyrian period and how Assyrians met their challenges. So we always hear about the brutality of the Assyrians and we have a quote, some quotes here from a number of people. And if you do a Google search, you'll find a lot of these quotes. The brutality of the Assyrians was extreme even for the ancient standards of cruelty. Uh, some people say, you know, these are the ancient Nazis. The Assyrians were the ancient Nazis, a term that everybody throws around. Um, a scholar by the name of Erika Bilibitru says, countries and peoples that opposed the Assyrian rule were punished by the destruction of their cities and the devastation of their fields and orchards and so on and so forth. Now, you know, it's interesting that some of these people who, who pretend to be archaeologists will say things like, the evidence shows that the city was destroyed in typical Assyrian fashion. What does that mean, typical Assyrian fashion? Well, it was burned. Well, cities were burned. You know, when, when you have war, um, it's difficult to believe that people would just go into a city and preserve it in the ordinary course of a war or a battle. So saying things like, in typical Assyrian fashion, is a misstatement of the facts, because really history does not show what these quotes are um, alleging. Uh, so uh, we have another uh, funny quote here from Jonathan Jones, a writer in England. Whether wrestling lions or skinning prisoners alive, the Assyrian king ran a murderously efficient empire. So either empires are murderous, and that should include all empires, or they're not all murderous all the time. And recently there was a, uh, a discussion about uh, Tucker Carlson was a noted uh, uh, journalist, um, and he made a comment about the British Empire being a benign empire compared to other empires. I think that belies a misunderstanding of what empires are. And it also reveals that people have not carefully looked into, for example, Assyrian history, which is considered to be extremely cruel. So, and then of course, Gary Webster screams, terrorists of the ancient world. Is this true? So let's look at the Assyrian challenges. Let's look at Babylon and Babylonia, try to understand it first of all, and then try to see how Assyrians dealt with the situation. Babylon is a city, Babylon, gate of the gods. It does not mean Babel as in confusion of languages, although it comes across that way in the Bible. Uh, Babylonia, the term, is a land, not a city, known in Mesopotamian sources as Mat Akkadi, or Somar and Ekad, or Kardunyash during uh, the Kassite uh, um, domination of Mesopotamia in the 16th century BC. Babylonia is not a self designation, the proper term is Ekad. Great city, a very important city in southern Mesopotamia rose to prominence in the second millennium BC. So who were the Babylonians? Now, according to John Nielsen, who's a specialist on uh, Neo-Babylonian history and as, as an Assyriologist um, at, uh, um, I forget the name of his university, but I will give you that source. They were made up of the descendants of Sumerians, Amorites, and Kassites. The ethnic identity of these urban populations had blurred into a common older, quote-unquote, Babylonian or Akkadian, the term usually used 
or people in the south is Akkadian, not Babylonian. Babylon refers to a city. Um, so their cultural traditions and institutions came together and they formed a, an urban population that referred to themselves as the people of Babel, in particular the city, but also there were people in Nippur in southern Mesopotamia. There were other people who were not strictly Babylonian. The land in its entirety was known as Eka. What about the Chaldeans? The Chaldeans' first appearance in historical records occurs in sources generated in, you guessed it, Assyria, not in the southern area or Chaldea. So the first people who used this term Chaldu or Chaldean were the Assyrians themselves in ancient sources. There is no self-identification as Chaldean in history, and we'll see references to that soon. The Assyrians initially knew little about the Chaldeans, these people in the south. Like Babylonia, Chaldu is described as a land, Kur, Matu, and not simply as a people, indicating that the Assyrians conceived of it as a distinct territorial entity beyond Babylonia or beyond Akkad. Chaldean arrival in Mesopotamia. Why do we say arrival? Because there is perception that the, these people were not native to Mesopotamia, that they had come from outside of Mesopotamia into uh, the area of Mesopotamia. So when Chal Chaldeans first appeared in southern Mesopotamia, we don't know when it is, but it's plausible that they arrived, according to one scholar, um, among a movement spearheaded by the Aramaeans that began at the end of the 12th century. And we're going to talk about Aramaeans as well. Was this a movement from, based on their language, from the, um, from the Levant, because they spoke a West Semitic language, uh, similar to Canaanite? Or were they coming from, as many people thought, from the Arabian desert or Syrian desert into Mesopotamia? We just don't know because there is no, uh, no recorded writing of this. There are no um, uh, clay tablets that tell the story of how the Chaldeans or uh, Aramaeans moved into Mesopotamia. These migrations, this is what we do know, these migrations caused major disruptions in Mesopotamia and were described by the Assyrian and Babylonian sor sources in the 10th century BC. While it's clear that the Chaldeans possessed their own distinctive identity, and this is by the ninth century, and this is really based on their tribal affiliation, not a larger ethnic identity. Um, a shared heritage with the Aramaeans can be postulated from monastic evidence, which indicates that the Chaldeans, like the Aramaeans, spoke a West Semitic dialect. Sometimes it's hard to tell who are all these people uh, whether they are Aramean tribes or Chaldean tribes, or sometimes even, according to one author, Arab tribes who are kind of moving around in this area. The Chaldean tribes that are identified in history are the Bittakuri, um, and, and you can know of their location according to historical records, uh, southwest of Borsippa. Borsippa, of course, is a city. Um, uh, Bet Amukani, Bet Yakin, and uh, the most famous uh, person from the Bet Yakin tribe is Nebuchadnezzar, the famous king of Babylon, who is known as a Chaldean king, around Ur and marshes to the east. Bet Shaili, near Persian Gulf, and Bet Salani, uh, east of Bet Dakuri tribe. And, and you notice the focus of the Chaldean tribes is southern Iraq. So it's very important to know. Later, of course, there's a misunderstanding of who is a Chaldean um, among the Assyrian people. And I, I hope it becomes clear by the end of this class what we're talking about in terms of identity, culture, and language, and so on. Regional understanding and diplomacy among the Assyrians. Now, Oftentimes, Assyrians are thought to simply react to a situation by waging war. Well, that's not true. Not true according to the records, if we carefully look at them. 
And it's not true in particular if we do not simply amplify the voices of certain kings who talk about, perhaps in their rage, perhaps to psychologically intimidate others, talk about what they've done to the enemy once the enemy has gotten them to a point of no return, if you will. As Assyrian involvement in southern Mesopotamia evolved, so did their understanding of the region with implications for the native populations there. Not one population, native populations. During the time of Adad Nirari, for example, in this after our period, beginning in the Neo-Assyrian period, the southwest lost territory to the Assyrians, or the south lost territory to the Assyrians, meaning Babylonia, if you will. In the century that followed, the relationship between the two kingdoms saw several shifts. Sometimes it was a friendly relationship. Sometimes it was a more difficult, contentious relationship between what we call Babylonia, or really Ekin, and Assyria. Nabusham Ukin and Adad Nirari, uh, king of Babylon and Adad Nirari, exchanged daughters in a diplomatic marriage that led to an alliance and peace. Of course, later, this peace breaks and there are periodic conflicts. Understand that in the history of the relationship between the north and south of Mesopotamia, there was mostly peace. It's the idea that we think that you know, the, 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 when the conflicts happen, we magnify them to, to, as if fill the entire gap of the history between the South and the North. That's not the uh, ordinary course of events. The ordinary course was a peaceful coexistence between the North and the South. When there was conflict, of course, the Assyrians used a policy of divide and rule, um, for example, with Babylonians and Chaldean tribes, and even within the Chaldean tribes themselves, because there were various Chaldean tribes. Shalmanasar, who you see here pictured, uh, his inscriptions make clear that Assyrians categorized the Chaldeans as an urbanized population who dwelled in walled cities and towns, but who were not Babylonians. So during the time of Shalmanasar <clears throat> in the Neo-Assyrian period, which, which is just the beginning of the Neo-Assyrian period, we see that the Chaldean population has already settled in what is known as Babylonia. Sometimes it's termed Chaldea. Again, this is not a native designation. Uh, but Shalman sort of differentiates between Babylonian and Chaldean. He does not, he understands the two to be different, and they were different. Um, styles himself at one point as a champion of Babylon in his defeat of the Chaldeans, having vanquished the Beddakuri. Now, you see the reference there is to one particular tribe. And there are various tablets that show that um, these tribes were considered different in terms of their political alliances and political shifts with regard to Assyrian power. So sometimes certain chiefs of particular tribes would ally themselves with the Assyrians. Sometimes they would seek a treaty with the Assyrians against the other. Uh, what are known as Chaldean tribes. So there's a letter, um, I don't cite it here, but there's a letter, um, a noteworthy letter, where one Chaldean chief is, is telling another Chaldean chief, why are you uh, not allying with us? Of course, it's not based on ethnicity. It's simply based on where they're living. Why are you not allying with us against the power of Assyria? Why have you chosen to ally with them? So where did this term Chaldean come from in addition to Assyrian sources? Biblical authors apparently perceived Babylon as a state ruled and led militarily at that time by the West Semitic tribal leaders, especially Chaldeans. On the basis of this evidence, scholars have sometimes adopted the term Chaldean dynasty in reference to the royal house founded by Napolosa at the end of the sixth century. Napolosa being a formerly Assyrian general who switched sides and went uh, to, to fight um, Assyrian power, the sons of Ashur Banipal, and uh, eventually to defeat Assyrian power and uh, to assist in the taking of Nineveh by the Medes in 612 BC. Now, Professor uh, Paul Elaine Bulot, uh, contrary to the Bible, rulers of the Babylonian Empire never refer to their subjects or their army as Chaldean. When we turn to terms describing members of the ruling dynasty, 
we encounter a similar paucity of information. While the biblical evidence has imposed the term Chaldean dynasty, the Neo-Babylonian kings never adopted the designation Chaldean. In fact, the term was never adopted. Not only do we not find no ancient claim for the Chaldean origin, but the term Chaldean does not appear even once in late Babylonian cuneiform documentation. This, of course, includes documentation during the Middle Assyrian period, the time which we're concerned. And of course, one of the most famous uh, kings of Babylon known as Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, he is the one who conquers Jerusalem. Um, according to Professor Below, we find a couple of, um, a couple, we find only a couple occurrences of the term Aramean in sources from the time of the Babylonian Empire and in all cases in references to single individuals. So and so the Aramean, not the Aramean people. Therefore, relying solely on the cuneiform sources from Babylonia, which are relatively abundant, we find no evidence that Nebuchadnezzar considered himself the ruler of Chaldeans and Aramaeans. In fact, um, Weissman's book on Nebuchadnezzar, uh, written in the 1980s, I believe, um, a very careful study finds no sources, zero sources, that Nebuchadnezzar referred to himself as a Chaldean at all. Well, what about the Aramaeans? Various theories of scholars, such as as to their origins, and of course the Bible in Deuteronomy refers to Abraham uh, as a uh, wandering Aramaean. Various theories of scholars um, say that their origin is in the Arabian desert, and some say from the Levantine coast. Um, there's questionable architecture or art forms, whether they really belong to Aramaeans or not. No evidence of a centralized rule or government. Okay, uh, so, sorry, some questions are coming in. I'm going to wait until the end uh, to answer them. John Joseph is a, um, a historian that I, I really like. He's written a book on, on modern Assyrians and their history. He studied Assyrian history very carefully, but he and I disagreed, and I have various correspondence with him uh, about these disagreements where he feels that uh, there is no such thing as Assyrian continuity. And uh, his book, which I will hold up here to show you, called Modern Assyrians in the Middle East, um, which I'll give you a reference to, is based on his earlier book, which was Nestorians and Their Muslim Neighbors. And in both books, but in, but in the latter in particular, he argues that Assyrians never really continued on in history. They, just, they somehow disappeared. Um, and where, how did they disappear? So in, this, in his second book, because there were a lot of questions raised when he wrote his first book, Historians and Their Muslim Neighbors, in the 1960s, he says that essentially um, the Assyrians disappeared into the Aramaic-speaking people. And we're going to explore his, um, his theory uh, in a couple of minutes. So... He says, from their humble beginnings as, a wa as wandering tribesmen, this is a perception of the Aramaeans that you know, people had, but we don't know if this is really true. The Aramaeans emerged by the end of the second millennium BC as an important factor in the cultural, political, and economic life of Southwest Asia. Um, another quote, the expansion of Assyrian rule over lands beyond the Euphrates, however, became a major burden to the Assyrians and proved to be a suicidal act. Um, I always found this phrase, this, this sentence very funny in John's uh, book because his understanding of culture and uh, cultural transmission is really lacking in, in this um, understanding of history. Suicidal act, meaning although the Assyrian Empire grew, because it changed, it was really a suicide. Well, that goes for you know, any empire that grows, Roman, British, and so on. Because, you know, if the British, for example, conquered India and now have curry in England, it doesn't mean it was a suicidal act of Britain to conquer uh, India. I don't know. 
at some point it might be a moral suicidal act, but certainly Britain maintained its power throughout the world by conquering a lot of nations. And of course, conquering also transforms the conqueror. Um, Pittard, uh, who John Joseph quotes, says that the Arameans were one of the most important ethnic groups in the Near East. And again, this is based on language, and we're going to go into that. Um, use of Aramaic for John Joseph means that the Assyrians were conquered and the Assyrian population could not resist Aramization, he says, leading the Assyrians to being outlived and absorbed. And this is according to Tudmore. He quotes Tudmore, whose understanding of the Arameans comes really more from the Bible rather than archaeological and textual evidence. We know from history, and you can see in uh, archaeological evidence here, that Aramaic and Akkadian scripts were side by side in the Assyrian administration. So the Assyrians took the Aramaic script. Why? Because it was useful. It was easier to write. It was easier to communicate with. It was not seen as a transition from the Assyrianness that they had into something called Aramaeanness because there was no such thing to the Assyrians. The Assyrians grouped this word around the script and the people who wrote it and used it because the Assyrian Empire absorbed people, as we'll see. But you can see very clearly the, um, the evidence shows that the person writing on a clay tablet is using Akkadian and the person writing on a scroll Unfortunately, we don't have many of the scrolls because they were easier, um, they disappeared more easily or they were burned in fires and so on, but we do have the clay tablets. And even on clay tablets, sometimes we do have Aramaic writing. During the time of the Assyrian Empire, during the time when Assyrians knew themselves as Assyrians. So associated with the Assyrians was it, this language, that the Aramaic script became known as Assyrian writing. And this is in particular the script. And sometimes we confuse a script with the language. Um, those are two different things, but the Aramaic language also came in because of the interaction and entered the Akkadian language and the Akkadian language entered the Aramaic language. Were the Arameans a nation? It's important to ask. Some scholars define national identity as a body of people who feel that they are a nation, a body of people who feel like a nation, Rupert Emerson. Uh, Benedict Anderson, who's written uh, extensively about his theory of imagined communities in his book, Imagined Community, says that national identity is not an inborn trait. It is essentially socially constructed or, in his words, imagined. So were the Arameans a nation, according to either Benedict Anderson or Rupert Emerson? Well, we know there were various city-states which may have used the Aramaic language, and sometimes it's, it's a mixture of Aramaic and Luvian, which is a different language. Uh, various city-states with no certain identity developed in the Levant and present-day Syria. Eventually, these were incorporated into the Assyrian Empire, first mentioned during the reign of Tiflat Pileser the first. I have crossed the Euphrates 28 times, twice in one year, and campaigns were typically done once a year, in pursuit of the Ahlamu Arameans, is the reference. Now, that's an Assyrian term for the others. It is not a self-designation, as we said. You can Take a look at the uh, map here and see, and of course you're going to have this PowerPoint. You can see from this map that there were many different city states, um, some, some districts and so on that perceived themselves perhaps as speaking the same language, perhaps a similar language, but certainly not a nation state, certainly not an imagined community by any stretch of the imagination. Script and language do not make national identity. The spread of the Aramaic language over large parts of the ancient Near East in the early first millennium BCE or BC has reinforced the idea that the people who used Aramaic writing should be defined as Aramaeans and as such were also related through a common set of cultural traits. 
a Western scholar's desire to categorize Aramaeans in cultural and, and ethnic terms. And this, according to Professor uh, Dominic Bonatz, is error. Among the, and why is that? We're going to go into that um, in a little bit. Among the first scholars to attempt to identify Aramaean art, and, and we're looking a little bit at, a, at the history of understanding how this, this term came to be coined, Aramaean. Among the first scholars to attempt to identify Aramaean art was Eckhart Unger, who mainly refers to the sculptures from Zin Chibli. For him, a typical Aramaean ethnic marker, because of its assumed Syrian Semitic origin, is the, quote, long beard with shaven top lip and underlip. Victor Christian relates only that new elements of clothes and hairstyle to the new ethnic element, i.e. the Aramaeans prominent among these elements is the Aramean mustache. You could see, and this is from Bonat, that it doesn't quite work. In other words, defining these as a people, as an identity, as, a, as Aramaeans, doesn't quite work by these indicators. And according to Peter Eckermans and Glenn Schwartz uh, in the book Archaeology of Syria, while assessing the significance of Luvian or Aramean states in Syria, again, the states that we were looking at, um, it must be recalled that our information on the ethnic composition of the diverse Iron Age regional states in Syria primarily concerns the rulers. As a result, it is by no means clear what the ethno-linguistic makeup of the majority of the populations of these polities was. Certainly, the material culture shows no distinction between states dominated by the Luvians or the Aramaeans, or even, I would add, the Hittites. No architecture. There is no building type and no element of town planning that could be exclusively ascribed to the Aramaeans. Novak, <clears throat> Mirko Novak, 2014 article on the architecture of the Aramean cities made this point very clear. Aramaeans, Luvians, or whoever else were the builders of the Syrian Anatolian cities, meaning in Syria where we think the Aramaeans were, shared a common set of architectural heritages. In consequence, the layout of their cities shows many similarities. So there's not one that we can say, oh, this is Aramean and this is not Aramean. No such thing. According to Professor Bonant again, the argument is circular, and he quotes uh, one of the um, um, or two scholars that have written an article here to, to show how circular the argument has been for Aramean identity or Aramean culture. Quote, and this is from uh, Kipinski and Tino. The material culture of Aramean sites is deeply rooted in ancient local traditions and thus does not reveal a stranger world. Hallmarks of Aramean groups shows an original and varied economy, shifts in settlement patterns, and a strong identity which is mainly perceptible in the artistic field. And of course, uh, Bonatz criticizes this and says the sentence seems to be symptomatic of the dilemma we are facing when we take the Aramean-ness of Syria's Iron Age as granted, because it cannot be taken as granted. Where apart from a few inscriptions, where apart from a few inscriptions, is the archaeological evidence for Aramean sites, hallmarks of Aramean groups, and their strong identity, mainly perceptible in the artistic field. And according to Dr. Bonatz, who's an archaeologist and uh, a careful scholar, there is no such thing. No distinguishing material culture, in other words. None of the archaeological uh, archaeologists concerned with the period of the Aramaeans in Syria, including those who advocate for Aramean identity, would take other material culture categories such as pottery, for example, which is very important identification, or seals as evidence for an Aramean identity or ethnicity. The simple reason for that is the undeniable lack of linking technical, stylistic, or iconography iconographic traits among the widely spread artifact groups. The corpus of Iron Age seals from the Syro-Anatolian and Levantine region is symptomatic in this respect. Scholars have demonstrated that based solely on the seal iconography and forms, it is impossible to distinguish between Aramaean and Neo-Hittite or Luvian groups. 
And these are the seals. Uh, this is an example of a seal thought to be a marker of Aramaic um, identity or Aramaean identity. And uh, what's important to note is that neither the Aramaic name or the seal owner of the seal owner nor the iconography of these identifies Aramaean ethnic or cultural identity. Instead, the choice of name and the seal motive, motive influenced by Assyrian Babylonian seal designs, obviously depended depend on the regional, social, institutional, political, or religious context of the seal owner. In other words, there is no common denominator here between these seals showing a common Aramean identity. Unlike Neo-Assyrian seals, for which everyone would have immediately recognized the identity of the seal owner as belonging to the Assyrian state, at least in the political sense, no seal would allow us to identify an Aramean identity. The main reason for this lack is the lack of political entity among the Arameans and the lack of a centralized governance, which, as the Assyrian case, could also have been responsible for the standardized pottery uh, production. So, again, we're dealing with material culture, we're, we're dealing with material evidence, not simply somebody even saying something, but actually what's been found by archaeologists. The impossibility of identifying a distinct Aramean artifact group may perhaps mirror the fact of a lack of a political identity among the Aramean tribal states. However, is it really advisable to seek an Aramean identity at all? So no coherent Aramean culture or identity has been found, thus if from an archaeological perspective, the concept of an Aramean art style has to be rejected, if no other artifact group allows us to highlight the aspect of an Aramean cultural identity, the question arises, what's the purpose uh, of us using the word Aramean at all? Um, it's similar, perhaps, to Semitic, but there is no Semitic nation. Is it indeed appropriate to suggest that there was an Aramean culture in the first centuries of the first millennium BC, even if we agree that cultures can be based on polarities, differences? Or is it the myth of Aramean culture that has caused the mistaken perception of the historical past? So what more historical evidence can we look at? Tal Ahmar, for example, in Syria. Um, the assumption can furthermore be stressed by the epigraphic, iconogra iconographic, iconographic and archaeological evidence from Tan Ahmad. By the end of the 10th century BC, a branch of the tribe at Adini, and you saw the city-state on the map earlier, was established at this place which they called Muswari, probably perpetuating the Middle Assyrian name Musul. Later, they changed the name to Tilbarsa, meaning well or son of the old man. From the time of uh, from that time on, Aramaic was probably the language of the ruling elites who, however, for their propaganda purposes, were using a steely and released in serial Hittite style and displayed inscriptions in the Luvian language. Hence, from the perspective of cultural tradition, nothing would speak uh, in favor of an Aramaean identity. Of course, Tel Ahmad became a prominent Assyrian provincial town. Aram is used, this term is used by the Assyrians. Like the word Keldu, Aram was also used by the Assyrians. Aram is a term mostly used by Assyrians and later in Hebrew Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, to refer to territories that roughly cover the boundaries of modern Syria. It only rarely occurs in Aramaic inscriptions such as the 8th century BC, uh, Sephar inscriptions, which seem to confirm that Aram or all Aram refers to geographical area that included the territories of Aramean and non-Aramean states. The only exception is Damascus, which was referred to as Aram or Aram Damascus in the Aramean, Aramaic inscription and the Hebrew Bible. And Shah Imurshu uh, or Damrashu in the Neo-Assyrian annals. The ruling classes in the so-called Aramean kingdom of Syria never referred to themselves as Arameans. The term Aramean is a foreign construct, again, generated from Assyrian, Biblical, and only a few local sources. Professor Bonatz um, 
tells us very clearly that the history of the ancient Near East contains several examples of population identities that occur only in the mind of the contemporary others, Assyrians or in our modern perception. What he's saying here is that the, the identity of the Arameans really occurred only in the Assyrian mind for others who were their contemporaries, not in themselves. At a certain moment in history, they might really emerge as a self-defined self identity, such as the Jewish Israelites, which also emerged from a larger Canaanite uh, um, ethnicity or, or um, cultural group. The Arameans in this respect present a very complicated case, one that constantly moves between fact and fiction. So now understanding that these people who John Joseph thinks took over Assyria, what really happened in the interaction? Uh, what really happened when the Assyrians were challenged? Um, According to one professor, rapid Aramization was favored by Assyrian imperial policy. Why would they do that? Is this suicide, as John Joseph said? Of large-scale deportations or movements of people, the purpose was to lessen resistance to Assyrian rule and replace other identities with Assyrian identity. There's the example of Guzana or Tel Halaf. One result of the movement of large populations within these territories of the empire, large territories, was the growth of the Aramaic script. Why? Because it was easy to use. And uh, Professor Mirko Novak says it's, a, it's a, an impressive example of the reciprocity of transculturation, not suicide, as John Joseph said. The aim of the policy was to transform foreigners into Assyrians. The formation and existence of an ethnicity are continuous processes that reflect changes in self-identification. Historical, archaeological, and textual evidence shows that the people who came to live in Assyria defined themselves as Assyrians. Assyria achieved, quote, a permanent and considerable increase in its population. This addition of others also changed the Assyrians themselves. Well, of course it does. Of course it does. All empires change according to the people they absorb. With regard to how Assyria was dealing with the challenges, they were assimilating all these foreigners into Assyrian culture. And what's important to remember, because a lot of times the reaction might be, well, they took in all these foreigners and of course Assyria was destroyed. You have to remember the Assyrian empire lasted for close to a thousand years. We're talking from the middle to the Neo-Assyrian period. This is a long time in history. This is not some event where people come in and the empire is destroyed. Changes occurred in, in Assyria, culture and language. This was empowered by Assyria's open definition of who was an Assyrian, an affiliation of the empire, a loyalty to the king, fulfillment of one's obligations, such as military service to the Assyrian army, Assyria assimilated various peoples in King Sargon states, and I, and I need to read this quote and, and just say some comments on it. Subjects of all four parts of the world, Assyrians uh, would say, the corners of the world, of foreign tongues with different languages without similarity, people from mountainous regions and plains, Nashipur al Dishta. As the light of the gods, Lord above all, supervises, I let dwell inside my new city on the command of Ashur, my Lord. So what keeps the Assyrians cohesive as an entity? It's their pantheon, their religious pantheon, but also the loyalty to the king and to the empire. Born Assyrians experienced in all professions, I set above them as supervisors and guides to teach them how to work properly and respect the gods and the king. So what Sargon was doing and what other kings had done prior to him is deal with the challenges of absorbing territory by teaching people to be Assyrians, by teaching them to respect the laws of the Assyrians, respect the laws of the empire, and what was sacred to the Assyrian uh, center. And people did become Assyrians. Experience in the courts of Kalhu, Dur Sharukin, Ashur, and Nineveh led non-Assyrians to adopt Assyrian culture 
and customs in their self-representation, and many times represent themselves as Assyrians. Assyrian standards in architecture, art, ceramics, as well as administration became predominant during this time, during the Middle Assyrian and especially the Neo-Assyrian Empire. According to Frederick uh, Mario Paulus, professor, and I'm going to stop in a few minutes. In sum, the people call the Arameans all but disappear after a long history going back to the Ahlamu, when they were first called that. They are all Assyrians now. But Aramean ethnicity survives in the form of a distinctive language with its attendant cultural context. Now, contents. Now, remember what uh, Bonat said. He, he disagrees with uh, Professor Fadas about what that culture was. Uh, Assyrian culture, on the other hand, is more identifiable. Aramean culture is less identifiable. Not sure what, what it is. According to Professor Ariel Bag, the Assyrian conquest of the Levant, including northwestern Syria, was neither a linear nor an easy enterprise. To construct a world empire and to maintain it is not easy, even with an absolute military superiority. World empires cannot be planned and are influenced by many unpredictable factors, both internal and external. In the long term, Assyria's goals were reached. Almost the entire region was brought under Assyrian rule, and raw materials, luxury goods, people, animals continuously flowed into Assyria, into the, the heartland, as tribute or taxes. And one of my favorite Assyriologists uh, says it very good about the Neo Assyrian period, which we're going to get into next. Neo Assyrian kings pursued an active policy of nation building whereby the citizenship of Assyria was routinely granted to the inhabitants of newly established provinces. As a result of this, by 600 BC, the entire vastly expanded country shared the Assyrian identity, which essentially consisted of a common unifying language, Aramaic by this time, and a common religion, culture, and value system. Yes, Akkadian was still used from time to time, but by now, Akkadian was replaced by the Aramaic script. So how did the Assyrians meet their challenges, uh, meet the challenges to their power? As Karl von Klauswitz says, war is simply the continuation of political intercourse with the addition of other means. Uh, oftentimes people refer to the sentence as war is simply diplomacy through other means. For Assyrians, war was a means toward stability, peace, and prosperity. War was never an end in itself. So the Assyrians did not, despite what you hear and see oftentimes, the Assyrians were not interested in just being cruel and waging war for no apparent reason. The Assyrians were not a ruthless people bent on killing and pillaging. The Assyrians favored political intercourse and only in rare instances used other means, quote unquote. The Assyrians did not religiously or culturally persecute people. They allowed them to be who they were in terms of their religion or ethnicity, but other people were absorbed into the Assyrian center and eventually became Assyrians. Assyrians knew the value of psychological intimidation and used 